Hello to you, friends. This is Dhamma on Air number 15. And after a very hot day here on Sri Lanka on the mountain, very dry, we moved outside. And that's nine questions. But first, the normal intro. Namo. Tasso. Bhagavato. Arahato. Samma Sambuddhasa, worthy, honorable, and perfectly self-enlightened, was the blessed Buddha. I'm trying with a new microphone system, a Sanken Cos 11D, so I'm sorry if uh, the sound quality is not ideal. There's also a little wind today. There's nine questions. The first one goes, how do I orient myself away from seeking sense pleasures? Very good question, because sense pleasure, karma chanda, is uh, the most dominant defilement keeping uh, beings in samsara, keeping them circling around between rebirth, death, aging, sickness, death again. Why so? Because uh, sense pleasure, by getting pleasure by seeing something, hearing something, smelling something, touching, Tasting something, touching something, and thinking something is the main way of attaining momentary happiness for sentient beings. The main way, the all dominant way. So it's very likely that at the moment of death, which determines the transmigration, there will be some sense desire there, some desire for sensing this or that. And this will lead to rebirth where you get a body that has sense organs and can sense and therefore can gain sense desire. How to uh, get away from it? Yes, uh, if have habitually been dominated with sense desire, this is uh, likened to in the commentaries to be uh, walking on the far edge of the road and starting to falling into the ditch to this side. So one has to, a blind man that goes to the far end of the, of the road and is, is in danger of falling into the ditch, into the lower states of being, from animal and downwards. You should say to him, ah, go to the other side, go to the other side. So what's the other side? It is to noticing the disgusting aspects, the repulsive aspects of all phenomena. And that is to look away from the features of it. When you see something, don't look for the a sexual object, don't look for well, the sexual organs or the sexually attractive features. Think of the intestines inside the body, which is the same disgusting, which is a disgusting feature of the same body. So any body, any object, any taste, any touch, any mental states has both attractive features and disgusting features. And it's forgetting and pulling away from the attractive features and focusing on the repulsive features and one redirect minds a way to, instead of wanting the object, then putting the object down. So that's the way to do it. It's classically called asupa meditation. Asupa means disgust uh, or dispassion. But uh, disgust is a better word for it. And there one uh, discussed some typical, the skeleton, all the bones up from the cranium to the uh, smallest toe and back again. Or one this on a on a rattling corpse, uh, one day old, three day old, bluish, swollen up, eaten by worms, rattling, uh, skin falling off, uh, organs falling out, uh, bones, all organs, flesh and blood rounds up, but bones still connected with tendons, uh, bones disconnected with tendons, bones lying on the, in a heap, and bones rattling, dust becoming dust, and then you do like that. When you could do like like that and envisioning that this is your own bones, and then you are close to having so much disgust and passion for the body that the sexual craving, which is uh, the strongest form of sense desire, and thereby the strongest form initiator of suffering, because any craving creates suffering. This is the second noble truth. So the craving for sense desire comes in, in different grades. Usually when one looks upon it in scale, it varies little from people to people and from age to age when you're young and when you're old. But basically, uh, the sexual craving, sense desire, kamachanda, is strongest. Then there's a uh, craving for food, 
and for drinking is number two. And then craving for money, which is basically a craving for all kinds of sense desire because money can be exchanged to any kind of sense desire. You can buy a ticket to the cinema and go and look, see something beautiful. You can buy some drugs and uh, get a, a attractive or a addictive state of mind. Uh, you can uh, buy any kind of food and so on. So money is also a desire for sense, a sense desire, craving. Uh, so all this gamut uh, running the world is basically sense desire, karma chanta. Since it's a form of craving, it is causing suffering. So basically it is uh, pushing the attractive features away from the object, any object, whatever it is, and then focusing and training the mind to focus on the disgusting features of the same object. So this makes mind, instead of being pulled towards the object, it makes mind, okay, I, can, I don't need it, I can pull it down. So it becomes detached from the object if it looks at the disgusting features and if it becomes attached to the object if it looks at the attractive features. So these two are two mirror images of the same, same object. So it's just a redirecting, an active redirecting of mind away from the attractive features to the disgusting features. Then there's a looking, the, the danger if in, in Kama Chanda is to, is to notice that uh, what is that killing me again and again and have killed me already a uh, hundred billion, 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 billion times. Is this Kama Chanda mainly, mainly. It's a main driver in samsara for all beings, also insects, devas, you name it, from high to low. Because they, they, they cannot find any happiness anywhere else than something they can sense. So seeing this danger that this is a killer, a serial killer, a major serial killer of all beings, that's a major danger. So you get this is a danger, Adinava. So you get a sense of urgency, Samvika, to push for Nibbana, where there's no sense desire. Where there's no suffering caused by sin desire, no addiction, no clinging, no panic. Question two: What advice would you be, be to become a one to, who wants to become a monk or a nun to a thing? Yes, do it when you're ready for it. Uh, first, uh, go to meditation centers regularly, at least three times of ten days, at least uh, one of one month. In the first month, there's many places you can do it, not only in Asia. So to see what is it to, to live the noble life? How is it to train if you do it on a full-time basis? Then uh, be very careful by reading all the disciplinary rules, the, the Vinaya. And there's also on my website, there's uh, two uh, very good summaries. The books are, the five books, but then there's two, they summarized in two volumes. Uh, by Venerable Tanisaro Bhikkhu. And then read the rules first, because these are the rules you, you have to live under. And uh, this is important. It's better not to become a monk, if you cannot live under the, the rules, than to become a monk and then break the rules and stay in the robes. Then you, it leads to a very bad result. Uh, unfortunately, very common today, among ordained, both uh, male and female. Very bad result. Worse in that than if, if they have stayed a, a lay person. And they're usually sexual transgression that is causing it. So don't enter the Sangha if you cannot stay celibate. Huh? Also, you cannot ma masturbate. And it's difficult. So this year you have to try out for yourself. I did that two years before I entered the Sangha. So to test myself, could I do it or not? It's better to test yourself as a lay people because if you transgress as a layman, or as a lay woman, it doesn't matter. You, you do nothing wrong there, yeah, that you're allowed to have sexual activities is if it's uh, with the right partner or if it's masturbation. It's, there's nothing uh, particularly uh, disadvantageous in that compared to other lay people. But since it's not allowed when you're ordained, when you have taken on the robe, then the, it leads to a very bad result because you get your food in, in order to stay celibate. Uh, so the lay people, the devout lay people, they are supporting the Sangha because they want merit. And they gain merit if the Sangha is clean, but not if the Sangha is not clean. So take very much care about that. Be very cautious about it. Approach the state slowly. 
go out and check it out. Come to the monastery where you want, want to ordain. Stay there uh, for, let's say, half a year as a layperson in white, uh, dressed in white, uh, respecting the ten precepts as an anagarika. And there are also many other... Uh, anagarika is a homeless person who has gone forth and respects a number of uh, precepts, more than the five. Usually the eight or the ten are more than that. And they are homeless, but they uh, and they live a noble life, but not as a monk. And this is kind of like 50%, 60%. And this is also a solution. This also can be a solution for one. So there's not only uh, lay people ordained, there's lay people anagarikas and ordained, fully ordained. They also, you, the fully ordained can be a novice, a samaneri or samanera uh, for some time. And they can, this can, it can be for a long time, a number of years. They also live with a, under, under a subset of rules that is not so, so uh, difficult to live under than living under the full monk with, or non Vinaya. So check it out first. Don't come in and burn the fingers. Because when you have the rope, when you have given the, taken the, 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 the rope, when you have been ordained, basically, then there's, uh, then it's very, very expensive to do mistakes. The Buddha, he, he said about it that, that in the other traditions, if you make a transgression, it's a disciplinary code. In other traditions, it is like falling down from a mute. If you fall down from a mute, you can raise up and t take the dust off. It's, there is, has been some uh, inconvenience, but it's a small deal. But by the way, he said that falling down from, from the noble life in the Buddhist robe, that's fa like falling down from an elephant. You can break a leg or you can break your neck, karmically speaking. So it can be catastrophic uh, if the transgression is habitual and over many years. Uh, so, so be very careful with that. Otherwise, I would say it's an ideal life. And the Sangha welcomes, of course, all who are seriously considering it. And it's, it's, it's not easy, but it's not impossible either. But one has to be fairly determined about it, to get ordained and to stay ordained. Uh, so, ehi bikus, ehi bikunis, come on. If you want, then do it. It's very, very, very advantageous. And it's a happy life. <laughs> very happy life. I can say that from direct experience. Question three. When the Buddha asks in which direction goes the flame, to the north, south, west, east, upon being extinguished, what was he referring to? The extinguishing of craving and all defilements or something else? It refers to a question which is of philosophical uh, nature, which uh, skeptical people often ask, and also with, from in the, within the Sangha and within the Sasana, they ask, uh, where you go, where you become enlightened? Where is the Buddha now? And it's a senseless question because uh, they don't go anywhere. And this, the simile of the flame is like this. So when you're extinguishing a flame, you have a candle and you, you blow it out. So it goes out. Nibbana, it goes out. Where does it go? This is a, a, a inconsistent la language, and it's a, it doesn't make sense to ask that question because the flame doesn't go anywhere. It just ceases to burn. It ceases to burn. Nothing else in there. So it doesn't go from here to there. It just ceases to burn here. What is this a flame that is ceasing to burn in samsara when one enters nirvana? This is a flame that is burning on ignorance. And if one should say there's two fuels, it's, it's, it's a flame that burns on, on ignorance and craving. And if one should say, are there three kind of fuels that this flame is burning on? Then it's ignorance, greed, and hate. So it's only that that is extinguished at the moment of attaining Nibbana. Nothing else. So nothing is lost there. There was no self or being there in the first place that ceased to exist. 
And who wants ignorance, greed and hate? Who wants that? Ignorance and greed and hate, they only lead to suffering anyway. That's obvious. Right? So it's the fire of that upon which existence in samsara burns, that ceases to burn. And when this, this flame of ignorance, when this flame of greed, when this flame of hate goes out, then it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't go to the south, it doesn't go to the north, it doesn't go up, it doesn't go down, it doesn't go to the east, west, or anywhere else. It just ceases to exist, ceases to burn. That entails freedom from all suffering. That entails transcendent peace. That ex entails the highest happiness. Nibbana. Neither more, nor less. So don't be afraid to blow up this candle of greed, hate, and ignorance. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of Nirvana. Question 4. A human being is, compri is comprised of organic material, which is various biological processes, such as the endocrine system, respiratory, and brain system of neurons, all of which is impermanent and subject to decay. Buddha also said that consciousness is impermanent. Indeed so. Momentary. Some Tibetan Buddhists speak about practicing Pauha, which they claim is a transference of consciousness at the time of death. Uh, some speak of clear light. Isn't it possible that this clear light is a byproduct of neurons firing and the chemical being released, which gives way to the vision of clear light? Uh, I cannot say what uh, Tibetan Buddhists speak about uh, in this case because I don't know this expression. Uh, but Tibetan Buddhists are more related to Hinduism. So I don't think it's something uh, relevant uh, for early Buddhism uh, at all. The clear light uh, is, is a real thing about consciousness being a, a, a real a form of radiation, a form of, of light. Buddha said uh, that consciousness is papasara. It's, it, it, it lights up everything. And at the same time, it shines from everywhere. This is says a double, double meaning about this word papasana. It can be interpreted two ways. And the Buddha often used that deliberate ambiguity to make economy of expressions, to say two things with the same word, or two things with the same sentence, or hitting two uh, different listeners in one sentence. It's an art, because you have to kind of like compress the message and use the expression exquisitely uh, fine-tuned to have some such ambiguities, some, such multiple meanings in the same word or in the same sentence. But it's often seen, and uh, it's very, very elegant. It's, it's something uh, i never seen others use this deliberate ambiguities. But nevertheless, so, so consciousness is a non-local thing. It is everywhere present. Uh, the, the local aspect of it is connected with the brain. So there's some neural processes going on uh, connected with consciousness. But consciousness is more fundamental. It's not a product of the brain. It's something more fundamental than biology. It's, so, it's something more fundamental than what we call classical physics. Basically, our science doesn't know today what what consciousness is, what it's made of. Uh, it doesn't re it doesn't really even know that it has local and non-local aspects. It's kind of like fumbling in the dark. What what this consciousness is? So Buddha says it's a, it's a form of radiation, like light, but it's not light, but still it's something that can see and perceive an object, and it shines upon the object from everywhere, and it shines from everywhere. So it's like if you had an object here, so it's, consciousness is shining upon the object from everywhere, and also it looks out in all directions at the same time. 
So these two together means that there's no focus. It's not like a lamp, a light, a light, a light bulb, which is, has a specific location and then it's shining out, radiating out from a center. It's not like that. It's more like it's something that is everywhere and then can be focused somewhere, localized here. Focus and take this aspect, looking out from there. Then it also can be localized here and looking out from there, shining from there. But it doesn't genuinely, essentially, inherently, has any specific location because it is everywhere. I think this uh, more or less answers the question. I hope so, otherwise uh, please ask again. So, again, uh, con many conscious phenomena is connected with the brain. But this doesn't entail that the brain makes consciousness. Like the radio, don't make the music that is coming out of it. Your phone doesn't make the conversation. It's coming from somewhere else. Space doesn't make the objects space contains. Consciousness doesn't make the objects it perceives. Nevertheless, obviously, you're using con you are conscious now about this was happening here now on your computer computer screen. Uh, so they are this the, the phenomena is connected, but in the case of brain and consciousness, uh, it's not a causal connection. Because as beings without a brain, they, they can still be conscious. So it means that it's, a, it's deeper down. It's a fundamental thing in, in existence in samsara. Buddha, he, he likened to some kind of trick that, uh, that a trickster he makes. He makes some kind of trick. It looks like that. But then it's something else. It's conjuring up a trick. So it's, he, 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 he likened it to some kind of trickery. That there's something hidden behind a curtain or under the table or somewhere else. It looks like that, like the trick, but it's, the nature of it is completely different. Question five. How did Mahamogayana visit other worlds when there is no self, soul or astral body, etc.? Could it have been a form of lucid dreaming or something else? No, uh, there's no self, there's no self, uh, there's no soul. Astral body, we have to take a small, uh, small uh, notion here because this can be overlapping with some Buddhist concepts, which has some reality. So when you go out, uh, do you have only one body according to Buddhist theory? No, there's two bodies. There's a mental body that is overlapping or superimposed with the physical body. So this mental body is basically made of consciousness. This will we could call the astral body. And it's superimposed or localized. The particle aspect, the non-wave aspect, is localized on the body because it's clinging to that body. That consciousness is clinging to the, the body it's, it's co-localized with and congruent with, completely fused with. How is this can be separated? So when the Buddha and Mahamukhyana and all who can have these apinas, these uh, magical superpowers, they can send a copy of the body or many copies of the body, as many as they want, to another place in two fundamental different ways. They can send a mental body, and that I think is a very close to what we call an astral body, but it's not a self and it's not a soul, because it's also impermanent. They can send a mental body, a mental copy out to somewhere else and to interview some people. And they have, can perceive that this is what this body do. This body can act, uh, this astral body or mental body can act completely independently. And it senses everything, has the same abilities as a, a normal body. However, it has no weight. And if you press the hand of it, poof, then it, it disappears. So, uh, it's a, it's Manu Maya. It's mind-made. It's a mind-made body. It has no weight. It's made out of consciousness. It appears to other beings as being a normal body. But if they touch it, then it disappears. Right there. There's a very nice story about... <laughs> this is uh, two brothers that enters the Sangha. Uh, little Wayfarer and Big Wayfarer. 
they were called wayfarer because their, mo their mother uh, gave birth to them. Uh, why she was faring away between her husband and her parents was at that time it was usually that, and it still is in Asia, that the woman goes to the parents to give birth. But she gave birth on the on the way, and so they were called uh, little wayfarer and big wayfarer. And uh, big wayfarer, he 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 quickly became arahat. And little wayfarer couldn't do it because he had scolded somewhere else, someone else to because he couldn't remember in a former life because the other man couldn't remember the text. And then, as a result, he couldn't remember the text himself. And actually, his brother was so angry with him that he couldn't remember a single stanza, a single sentence of the Dhamma. That he says, "Ah, split, little brother. You cannot do it. You are too, you are too nuts. You can't remember anything." And then he sat outside one day, outside the monastery, and cried. And then the Buddha, he he came and saw him, say, "Ah, what's the problem?" And so he, little Rafa, explained that his brother basically had kicked him out. And so the Buddha, he, he looked back and saw his abilities and that he, he could become an arahat at the very same day. Uh, so he gave a meditation object, a piece of cloth that was falling apart. Uh, and then the little wayfarer went down to the pond and sat with this cloth that was falling apart, a piece of rotten cloth. And then the Buddha and, and some hundred monks, they were invited to dana, to a dinner, a lunch uh, at at a, a, a private house, and they made up there, and then uh, there was one monk missing, and so they sent back a waiter uh, to the monastery, Jitavana monastery, and there a little way far he has attained arahatship, and then he replicated himself uh, in Manama to uh, naked monks that were walking around. Then uh, the female waiter, she came back, and she was horrified. So there was a, a lot of uh, f f male monks going around naked inside Jitavana Monastery. And then Buddha knew and smiled because he knew now our little wayfarer has attained the super magical powers and he has uh, replicated and he wants to tell a story about this. So uh, Buddha said, ah, you go back uh, and then you uh, press the hand press the hand of one of these uh, naked men. And the, way, the, <laughs> the female waiter, she was uh, not too much to do it, but nevertheless she did it. And when she touched the first one, poof! All of these naked monks uh, disappeared, and only one, the physical body of Little Wafer, was there, and he was dressed up and ready to go. And then he came uh, along with the, with the other monks. So from that story, we know this, uh, and also other stories. Buddha usually, when it is when this a monk become, attains arahatship out in the jungle, uh, six hundred kilometers away, then the Buddha will send a mind-made body and interview him and congratulate him out in the forest. The monks are waiting for the Buddha to come because the Buddha will know when it happens. So he will send out an astral body or a mind-made body, Manumaya, a mind body, a mental body, body made of consciousness, out and congratulate the monk uh, who has become an arahat out there in the forest. However, the Buddha and also Mahamukhayana could also send a physical body they're the physical body, can also be a replica of the physical body. Both, you can say their own, but it doesn't make sense. The replica is exactly as the, the, the real body, huh? And it's as real as that. This body, this physical body, replica physical body, has, has weight. If it steps out upon a weight, you can see it has the exact same weight as this body. And it also has a complete autonomic function. And this body perceives what the replica does and sees. And can and can make it to, make it to do different things, but this body can also act independently. So it's a replica, autonomic replica. It doesn't disappear when you touch it. It has weight and is physical in the same sense as this is a physical body. What uh, Mahamogayana sent out there in uh, all these stories that I, where he goes to the devas and uh, ask them what they did to become devas. And when he goes to the ghosts, the petas, and ask them what they did to become ghosts, the, the story doesn't tell uh, what he sent out, a mind body or physical body. Uh, but it has nothing to do with lucid dreaming. It's not a, it has nothing to do with dreaming. Nothing. So, there's two bodies also now. There's a mental body and a physical body. They are superimposed, but out-of-body experiences, which you can have doing drug uh, intoxication, for example, LSD or psilocybin, magical mushrooms or whatever, they are the, f 
the mental body leaves the physical body and can look down upon it and say, what's the physical body do? And this can be experimentally verified. So if you have a sign, you can show this up back. Then the, the, the body can, the, you can make a recording. Say, for example, you, you write the number seven on the back of the person or put a sign number seven on the back. Then the, the, the person seeing that from above can report the number seven of after having come back and entered the physical body again while never have had set, set eyes on his own back. So this is experimental evidence that this mind-made body is in existence. But it's very difficult uh, to practice because these out-of-body experiences are experimentally uh, difficult to, uh, to, to control. Uh, neither doing LSD nor psilocybin or any other kind of magic mushroom uh, intoxication can you kind of like want it. So you don't basically don't have any control whether that happens or not. And the same thing also for out-of-body uh, experiences during near death. These also, are, this is, people are dying, then uh, the doctors are busy uh, doing something else, uh, resuscitating, getting the, the person back to life. And they, they often, often tell of their out-of-body experiences long after they wake up. There is too late to make experiments. So it's difficult to do. Uh, but they, it can be done, and it has been done in, in a few cases. So now there is two bodies, the mind body and the physical body. They are separable. And when the Mahamayogayana, he had two choices then of sent out, a replica of the physical body and a replica of the mental body to make these interviews with the devas and with the ghosts. Question six. How properly to remove broken Buddha statues which are used to worship uh, the best Buddha uh, uh, statue at home? Uh, I would dig them down, actually. Uh, swap them in a piece of cloth, uh, silk or whatever, nice cloth, and then dig them down. Uh, if, they can, if they cannot burn, if it's made of stone. If it's made of wood, then I would burn them. It's not something the text says something about. But the nice thing of digging them down is that uh, the people coming in later generations, they would see them and say, uh, how did we make Buddha statues at that time? What, what's the iconography at that time? And this is part of the archaeology that we are using now to interpret how people saw and looked and used and lived the Buddhist life uh, 2,000 years ago and 1,500 years ago and so on. So it will make a, 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 an addition to the historical record if they were digged down. But this, of course, only goes for statues that are made out of something that cannot degrade. Not of wood, but of stone or uh, clay or whatever. Metal also could do. Dig them down. What is Bandit's opinion about women according to Buddhism? I mean, why did the Buddha not allow women to be nuns in the first place when uh, his foster mother, Bajabhati, asked for permission to enter the order? Yeah, this story we first take about. Uh, the Buddha's mothers also, also always die at the seventh day after their birth, usually of, of uh, birth fever, the fever you get from infection during the birth process, genital infection. So uh, all Buddhas are taken care of by another woman. In the, in the case of the Buddha, it was Queen Mahamaya's sister. And she also had uh, other children and also other small children. So she said, and she later wanted to enter the Sangha and ask for permission to enter the Sangha. And two times the Buddha said no. And why did he sit and sit and say no? Uh, third time he did, he, she asked then available Ananda, uh, because her determination to become a nun was really genuine and really deep, deep felt. Uh, so she pushed for it. She asked Venerable Ananda to talk for her, and Venerable Ananda went to the Buddha and asked for permission to make the Bhikkhuni Sangha, the Sangha of nuns. And at the third request, he allowed a uh, woman to enter the Sangha. And why he didn't do it in the first two places was that he said that uh, if females was not allowed, then the Sangha would last for 500 years. But if they were allowed, then it only lasts for 250 years. However, he didn't know at that time that, uh, and it could not be known at that time, that after his death, then Venerable Kasapa, Mahakasapa, as they call it here in, in, in Asia, 
he actually uh, made the Sangha last 5,000 years. Irrespective of women, of females entering or not entering. Uh, but this is a, Buddha couldn't know, even he was, they say he's omniscient, couldn't know that particular moment because it wasn't determined. It was actually conditioned by a deva throwing a flower down on the ground from above, a divine flower, which a wanderer he picked up and carried along with him away from the funeral uh, procession of the Buddha. And there, K Kasapa, he came, Ma Kasapa, he came walking down and he saw that ah, this is a divine flower. And he asked, where, where do you have this flower from? He asked the wanderer, was a recluse of another tradition. And the wanderer then asked, ah, this is your master who has died. And the devas were throwing flowers down and I picked it up. This, that the deva sh should throw down this flower was not determined when the Buddha said this about the 250 years and the 500 years. It was not determined yet. And therefore it could not be known. Even though we are omniscient, it could not be known. All known. It can, they can only know what can be known at every given time point, which is a subset of all possible events. So uh, let's say, uh, let's take uh, other broader uh, males, females, uh, whether animal or devas or uh, in the human case, what is the relation? Yes, says uh, all properties that we have, the body height, the intelligence, the looks, uh, the richness, they are karmically determined. This is what make high and low. And it's so that uh, females have made some slight more uh, errors in their life, so they have ended up on a, on, the, on a little lower position. When I say lower position, it doesn't mean that they are less worth, because all beings that has a consciousness can attain Nibbana and will attain Nibbana in a given future. And this that they have, this ability, this seed in them, in their heart, in their mind, to be enlightened, this makes them equal worth. So their worth is the same, whether they are insect or deva or human being or non-human being, male or female, doesn't matter. They are equally worth. But at a given time point, they are not on the same level. Huh? Devas are higher than us now, but they can fall to a lower level. Animals are lower than us, but they can go to a higher level. There's a story about a frog being a, going directly, without going through the human level, going directly to the divine level. In the stories, uh, the story goes that uh, in a cave, Sariputta he was sitting reciting the text. And then there was a lot of uh, people coming, people coming and listening, and there was also a frog. And this frog was sitting a uh, little nearby and listening to it, and was very devout about this recitation of the Dhamma by Venerable Sariputta. Then a wanderer came with a stick, and he put his stick right on the frog, and the frog died there on the spot. But it died in a good state of mind because it was so devout. And there, because, because of this devoutness, this f great faith, Sadda, it felt, and this great uh, love for Sariputta and his speech for the Dhamma, it made it trans be the, born as a deva, a male deva, which then came down and reported it. And uh, that, he, that one moment ago he was a frog. And nobody believed him. But then they asked Venerable Sariputta whether this was true. And Sariputta confirmed that it was, this was true. So there was a point, there was a message there to learn from the frog that became a deva in one go. So when females are per se in a little low position, it doesn't mean that all females are worse off than all males. Uh, because it's two normal distributions. That is a, a distribution where most people have intermediate qualities. For example, body height or body strength or intelligence. If you take the intelligence quotient, for example, you say there'll be some males at very low, some males are very high. And then the, the most of them have in the middle. So it's a bell shape. Whatever characteristics you, you measure on a population, you get this bell-shaped distribution. This also goes if you measure the females. But if you take the males and the females, for example, the intelligence quotient, and put them apart, then the distribution will be slightly off-centered. This means that the most intelligent females, they will be more intelligent uh, than the medium uh, intelligent man. But the most intelligent man will be more intelligent than the most intelligent woman. So the distribution are slightly skewed. 
being male or female is not something that you preserve in samsara. We have all, all, all beings have been both males and females. Uh, billions of times. Billions of times. There's a nice story about a small girl in, in that can remember her prior life where she was a man that has two wives inside Katukastoda, which is not far from Kendi, which was killed and then interviewed uh, six years after her death. I could remember the name. The man he was a, has incense maker. She could remember two names of the incenses that was not present anymore, but, but was found uh, to be real. Uh, so this story was corroborated from, uh, from outside, also from uh, autopsy reports. Uh, so there you s see, and this, uh, in many cases of these, there's 6,000 stories from these children. Uh, I cannot remember how, how, how much the, uh, the percentage is that there's a, a, a mix, a, 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 where the rebirth has another gender, that, that male goes to female or females goes to male. Uh, but it's a significant percentage. It's fairly common, actually. So one doesn't stay the same. And it's minor transgression from ghost to male to female. This doesn't make much difference in, in the Buddhist context because both male and females can uh, be enlightened. And that's a project. Huh? Whether you, uh, enlightened as, you become enlightened as a, a male or as a female, doesn't matter. Nibbana, the Nibbana one attains to is the same for males and females. Uh, so it, it doesn't matter in that sense. It matters in the sense that all beings has their particular set of defilements. That is, a, a dog, the dog lying there and sleeping, they have some defilements they have to work on. Females have some set of defilements. And males have some set of defilements. So they have special kind of defilements. And it's these defilements and also abilities to do something good, something advantageous, leading to a higher rebirth, that is determining their destiny. And so the, the actual position where you are now, high or low, doesn't matter. It matters where you go. It matters what you do from here on and in the future. That's what matters. Whether you are this or that, male or female, high or low, deva or dog, doesn't matter. It matter what you what you do, what you say, and what you think now and in the future, coming ahead. So that will place you in the next week. What you already have done, that's that's too late. You cannot change that. Huh? That's an accumulation that has brought you here to that state wherever you are now. But that wherever you are now here, uh, this can't be changed. This can be modulated, and that's a chance we have. There's a personal freedom we have, and that's what we should use. I hope this answers the questions. Why every special reason in Buddhist order happened on Poya days? On uh, Poya days is a uh, new moon and full moon, especially full moon. It happens so because uh, when the lay Buddhists they start to visit the monasteries, there were many arahats at that time. Then they, they told that uh, other sects, Hindu sects and uh, Jain sects, they met at these two holy days and they got interviewed uh, with their with their with the 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 ordained people or the religious in that, these particular sects, and so they wish that this also should be so in in Buddhism. And so Buddha was asked about, requested about it, and so he said, yes, okay, uh, this this we can do from now on. We do on this day. Then the Buddha say, in the beginning they only did meditation. So they would go to the monastery and then they, the monks would sit all day long and all night long to the next dawn. And then, <laughs> the, then the lay people again complained to the Buddha that they, 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 they needed some more entertainment, some more communication with the monks than just meditation for 24 hours. And then the Buddha said, ah, okay, he told the monks and himself also, he started to uh, speak the Dhamma uh, to the lay people when they came to the monasteries. But this was only on request. So his original meaning was to, to say, I have no, uh, no churches and uh, no holidays. Just everyone do, do the purification for themselves, according to the Dhamma, whether lay or ordained. They go to the forest or they go to the summer house or they go into the bedroom and uh, do sense seclusion. And then they do meditation, reflection upon samsara, to gain advantage, to go upwards.
to gain a higher state of being, to gain a finer state of being, to gain a, gain a higher state of freedom and a higher state of happiness in the future. That's a job. So you don't need any monasteries or churches or Buddha statues or incense sticks to do that. But since a communication is a good thing, uh, we are doing it right now, then the Buddha agreed to it, but not before requested. And so it goes for all Buddhas. They don't make any rules before necessary, before there is a transgression. In the first 20 years of the Sangha, there was no rules for the monk, monks at all. Now there's 221 for monks and 327 for nuns. So in the beginning, the monks were so pure that it was entering the Sangha. Then the bad guys keep coming in, and the Buddhists made one rule after the other over the next 20 year period. But if it's not necessary, then keep it as free as possible. Keep it as open as possible. Because all these rules, they are inconvenient. They make you unfree. Huh? Uh, but if uh, people, they act uh, crazy, then you have to make the rules. If you have to speak, then okay, you have to speak. If you, if you have to preach the Dhamma, okay, you have to preach the Dhamma. But otherwise, it's better to stay silent and to, to calm down this conceptual thinking. It's something that I, I, to some extent, feel myself now, uh, the disadvantage of all this uh, teaching, because, uh, as you know, I teach a lot on the internet. And this, I meet a lot of people, and they write a lot of emails to me and about their problems and so on. So all this coaching, uh, Buddhist coaching of all these people, this, this uh, flames up a lot of conceptual thinking in my mind. And in the start, when I go back to the pillow, and have to silence the mind and have to silence vichaka vichara, conceptual thinking, directed thought and sustained thinking. Silence that down. Then it's difficult to silence because you have all this contact with the world, all this verbal contact, all this intellectual contact with the world and with beings. Uh, so there's a point there. Keep it simple, as simple as possible. But that's why uh, the poor days happen, uh, because basically other uh, religious sects has a, ha, had holy days on, uh, in the old days, the calendar were by the moon. Month also means moon, uh, has a relation to the word moon. Uh, so there's one full moon every month. Huh? Can't be two, but usually it's only one. So in all in old days, the holy days were on full moon on new moon, because they can be easily identified by looking at the moon. There was no clocks, uh, no computers, no, no dating. So uh, that's why, basically, it was transferred. And then also the white clothes was actually also transferred from other sex. So the re reason lay people are white clothes today uh, was a, a copycat from other sex also. This uniform, uniformation of the lay people in white clothes, which is very beautiful, I think. And also serves as a good way of training mindfulness, sati. Because when you are dressed all white, you have to be very careful what you touch, where you go, and so on, where you sit, uh, in order not to get uh, your, uh, your, your whiten the whiteness of the clothes spoiled. So it's a good teaching of, of how to stay clean, physically speaking. Uh, how to, to gain sati about what you're doing and where you sit and so on, what you do. Uh, so uh, there's a good point in, in, in choosing white clothes, actually. The last question is question nine. Consuming a glass of red wine is healthy, some say. I will doubt that. Uh, but never mind. It's a bad excuse. No. Uh, can consuming some glass of red wine break the, uh, the precept, the fifth precept? Yes, it can. Any kind of alcohol. Except like, like say, uh, rum in a rum cake where there's uh, very little rum or something like that. Uh, it's breaking, but drinking fluid, any kind of fluid alcohol, that's breaking the fifth precepts. It's worth noticing that uh, this is a major, 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 major problem. It's killing beings. All hospitals department have a liver department that is doing almost nothing else than repairing liver damage uh, and giving liver transplantations to people who have drunken their liver up. All families are spoiled because of alcohol. 
Uh, and people might say, ah, but a little a glass of red wine. Yes, but it increases because it, ha it, it causes a habit and it because you don't see the danger of it. Then later down the road, 20 years after when you lose the job or get a divorce, then suddenly ah, the drinking becomes little more and little more and little more and then, and then a bottle a day and then, then hard liquor. And so then suddenly it's a catch on. And when it's a catch on the physical body, when there's physical dependency, for the body to alcohol, you cannot go out of it. It's very impossible because if you stop drinking, then you start shaking and, and you become sick. You, there's a 80% mortality if you don't drink anything or get some special medicine uh, from this disease. So uh, people who are seriously addicted to, to alcohol, they cannot stop from drinking because then they simply die. And that's me in his uh, way with almost no return. The prognosis for alcoholics is very bad. Very, very bad. Very bad. Even for those who try to come out of it. And the limit, there's a gray zone between, ah, you have habitual drinking here and there until the dinner, and then suddenly uh, to the addiction, complete addiction here, where there's no way, it's alcoholic death for sure. And social catastrophe, loss of job, loss of family. Uh, Loss of economy, loss of house, loss of everything, loss of health, huh? brain damage also, serious brain damage. They cannot remember anything whatsoever. You go and interview any kind of alcoholic person, then you see that they tell the same story as they told you yesterday. They cannot remember that they told you this story. Why? The brain is gone. No computer. Kosakov psychosis is called, or Wernicke syndrome. Very well known in medicine. They get all kinds of complications from coming in. Also diabetes. Uh, so, alcoholic is terrible disease. And everybody says, ah, it's okay. Because they are in love with this mental state, this relaxed feeling of having drunk a little dose of alcohol. And don't sing the danger of it. So, as I say, uh, drinking a glass of wine here looks innocent. huh? But what about 20 years later? when you're having a divorce or lose your job, or having another life crisis, and then it's two glasses a day, a bottle a day, and then suddenly it's catch on. Don't do it. Just say no to it. You can live without it. Huh? It's clinging. Clinging to a baby bottle of drugging. Mental calm, mental calm gained by meditation is much more exquisite. Like mental calm from, a, from a, a slight intoxication. You're ruining your computer. You cannot remember anything. In the beginning, you can because there's reserve neurons. But 20 years down the road, suddenly you cannot. Because all the neurons, they're gone. Why? Because of this habitual drinking. Skip it. Throw it out. Addiction to rotten fruit juice. Fermented fruit juice. A rotten liquor, a rotten liquid, huh? fermented. No good. Crazy stuff. I think this is enough for today. Don't break the fifth precept. Because you're in your fourth precept. You are 80% Buddhist with the fifth precept broken. Then you also tell a lie, then you're down to 60%. Then you also accept a bribe or uh, trick the tax department, then you are down, you have stolen something. You're down to 40%. That's not enough to save your uh, rebirth destination. Keep it clean. Keep it clean. Sila first. Sila is the lifeblood of the Sangha. It's the lifeblood of your future. Keep it clean. Keep it clean. Namo, tasso, bhagavato, arahato, samma sambuddhasa, worthy, honorable, and perfectly self enlightened was the best Buddha. May all beings become happy by this information. Thank you for your attention.